Well, thank you for everyone attending. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, today we have a treat that we are, we have Andy Starnes of Insight Training uh, giving us a, uh, a webinar talking about um, the cutting edge of light and firefighting. And we'll uh, talk about the history and science of light. Uh, then we'll talk about the physiological, psychological effects of firefighters and how um, lighting affects their daily jobs and their daily duties. And then uh, talk about the techniques using different lights and why. Uh, but before we start, we've got a little bit of housekeeping uh, to do. Uh, first off, this webinar is going to be uh, recorded and a uh, link to the recording will be sent out after the webinar and feel free to share it with your team as you see fit. Um, if you have questions today, uh, go ahead and put them into the chat room, uh, the chat box, and we will uh, answer those in the middle. We'll have a little break Q&A and then at the end we'll have a Q&A as well. And then um, we're gonna be uh, at the end, talking a little bit about a, a webinar special that we are running. Uh, we have a structure fire uh, um, fire kit that is our BTS and command plus white and green light that we are put together. And we also are putting together a, uh, a wildland fire kit that has the uh, command amber and white light along with one of our um, red and white scout lights. So. Um, the other, the last thing about this is we will also be having two more webinars with Andy Sarns here in the next uh, few weeks. So um, after this, we will uh, send out a link to those and where we'll talk a little bit about um, different applications of context and how lighting is used in different contexts and different roles with different firefighters. So um, to introduce ourselves, I didn't get that to the beginning. Uh, I am Chris Giles of Fox Ferry Lighting and I do uh, photography and video and uh, marketing uh, applications. And, but more importantly, the expert in the room here is Andy Starnes. And if you don't already know Andy Starnes, he is a 25 year old year firefighter in EMS. Uh, he's a battalion chief in Charlotte, North Carolina, a level two uh, thermography certified instructor. Uh, his company is Insight, fire training, and they focus mainly on uh, thermal imaging cameras. Uh, they provide consulting to departments and manufacturers and on purchasing, education, and training. So with that, um, I will hand it off to Andy, and you can take it away. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for having me and allowing me to share uh, with you guys. I greatly appreciate the opportunity, and I greatly appreciate support from Fox Fury. If you don't know, Fox Fury has been a longtime supporter of Insight, and I was a fan of them long before they became a sponsor. I actually had a few of their products and was one of the reasons I reached out to them because I believed in the product prior to uh, that and found out there was even more wonderful people behind the product. So thank you so much. Uh, let me know once I hit share screen, if you can hear that, see this okay, Chris. Is that, you see the screen? Perfect. Yep. All right. I'm going to minimize a few things. So we're going to start off. We're going to talk about firefighting or firefighter lighting applications. Uh, a lot of classes you take in general focus on a lot of theory, uh, history and whatnot. We'll cover a little bit of that, but firefighters are more about why and how can I apply? So we don't need to know the exact workings of something as much as how it works on in our world, in that context, and how it benefits us and how we can use that. And we're going to talk about how our body reacts to light and how that affects what we can see as well. So everybody knows that a firefighter should carry a flashlight, right? And every firefighter I know carries one. My question to you is, is it charged? Does it have fresh batteries in it? And do you turn it on? And I'll get into why that's an important question here soon because of a, another issue we have in the fire service regarding training. However, if you carry more than one flashlight, there are a lot of good firefighters I see that understand a two-phase or three-phase approach. They'll have a helmet light, a right angle light, and a box light, and they understand why. So this is nothing new. We're just putting the pieces of the puzzle together so 
our other fellow firefighters can see this and understand it. And maybe you'll pick up a few nuggets of knowledge as you go along as I did when I was doing a lot of my research in this, because this was an eye opening experience as well for me. Uh, but firefighters need to understand that we need more than just one light and why and how that light works and, and what light for the right environment, because there's no single hose line for every fire or, and there's no single light for every incident either. So a little bit of an overview of lighting. As you know, we started uh, in the fire service with torches and candles and uh, gas lanterns. And then we finally moved into the age of technology with incandescent lighting. And those of you who have been on long enough to remember the light in the lower left-hand corner, which I came on in 1992, and these were still in use. Uh, these were great until you hit them with a hose stream or water. And what happened? They shattered. Uh, they couldn't take that. They weren't as durable. That's why they had that screen on them. That's an incandescent light bulb. Then we moved into the age of halogen lighting, which was much, much brighter, but it had some downsides to it initially. It was hotter, uh, caused some fires. We'll get into that. And then in 2014, we got into more commercial grade, cheaper, easier to, to purchase as far as from our budget and price point, LED lighting. And uh, there's been some misinterpretation and misinformation about the differences between halogen and LED lighting, and which one's more beneficial to us. We'll talk about those in a little bit more in depth, but this is your this is your one little snippet of history as far as how the fire service goes with lighting. And those of you who've been around long enough have seen all of these lightings. You don't have to be in the fire service since 1948 to see them. So what about incandescent lighting? Very poor lifespan. Why should you know about incandescent lighting if we're not necessarily using it? Uh, we'll get into that, but you probably see some incandescent bulbs in homes today in older homes and maybe some other communities where they haven't changed out. They generate large amounts of heat. I knew that, but I didn't know how much. And they fail when exposed to water or rapid temperature changes. This is what really shocked me is the inside of that filament can reach over 4,000 degrees. And the surface of that bulb, according to the manufacturer, can be anywhere between 150 and 250. Now I live in a, and that's Fahrenheit for my, my friends and uh, firefighters who are overseas that believe Celsius is superior to Fahrenheit. And I'm not going to argue with you on that. It's just harder for us to do the math. Uh, but if you look at incandescent bulbs in my 1950s house, I left one on in the closet by mistake one time, came home and was just playing around with the thermal imaging cameras I have and got it out. And it was reading between 400 and 600 degrees inside of that closet after 2400 or 24 degree, 24 hours. That's a lot of heat cause a fire and remember this the melting temperature of steel is 2750 2750 degrees fahrenheit so the inside of that bulb is way hotter than that so that's that's something to consider in in the generation of heat and when you're going in and looking for an odor of electrical or a problem in a house we shouldn't be using incandescent bulbs in the fire service but something for you to remember now however halogen lighting is used today and it's used a lot. It's used in all kinds of things from residential to commercial to our world. It's still used in certain cars and other things. Uh, as you can see in this picture here, the fire actually was caused by an overheated halogen lamp. And if you've had to go investigate a odor of electrical before something burning, you've probably noticed that a halogen lamp generates tremendous amounts of heat. Those of us who had to work on the office environment or underneath a light for some period of time have found that these halogen lights can create an uncomfortable work environment because of the heat. Now, the positive side of them, they were extremely brighter, tremendous lumen ratings, which is how we rate the brightness of that bulb, but it had a tungsten filament sealed inside of it with what's supposedly an inert gas, you know, something that's supposedly not flammable, but it generated massive amounts of heat. How much heat? Hmm, enough heat to explode, enough heat that you know, it generated a shorter lifespan. And if you've ever made the mistake of when you were changing one or you can't touch it with your bare hands because the oil from your skin would cause the bulb to fail. Now, I grew up watching cartoons and loved Batman. So love Robin, what he would say, he would say, holy whatever, Batman. Well, holy halogen, Batman, that's hot. This is anywhere between 482 degrees and 2012 degrees Fahrenheit inside of the interior wall of a halogen bulb. Now, in our world, is, is when they're making everything safer, do you think that's a good idea to have a bulb that generates that much heat? If you've got kids, you've got 
you know, family, you don't want your house to burn down, not a good idea. Now they've got some that generate less heat now, but that is what it had to generate at least 2000 degrees to create that light. And that's pretty significant. Now, when we talk about LED lighting, when they first came out, they were extremely expensive. They, they didn't generate as much light as, as the others as halogen did, but now they're way more efficient, vastly superior to halogen bulbs, lasting 10 times longer and consuming 85% less electricity. Now, let's think about this for a minute. How many of you uh, love to save money? Probably most of you. And if you work for the fire department, you probably, like me, you probably count every penny. So if I went around your house and I had incandescent or halogen bulbs in your house, your power bill is going to be significantly higher than mine if I had LED bulbs in my house. So just from a common sense perspective, we're going to save energy. Now, initially, they were pretty expensive, but they've come down in price now anywhere from a penny a bulb to as much as $10 or more per bulb. And the design of the reflector behind it makes a difference in how that light is actually transmitted and focused. Any of you who are into music understand the value of a cone in a speaker and how that affects the sound. Well, that reflector affects how that light is actually focused or uh, if it's a wide or, you know, perimeter or, or a para, what we call it, a, a panoramic light versus a focused beam. So here's an example of us wearing, I got on a uh, headlamp here from Fox Fury, a right angle light that's hanging down a little bit lower and a box light that you can't see. And you're like, why do you need all those lights? Well, we'll talk about why here more in a minute, but understand a lot of our stuff fails and I always like to have a redundant system in place. So let's talk about the importance of proper lighting. If you've worked on the, in the fire service, EMS, police, whatever, you understand it's important to be able to see, see the things that could hurt you. Dr. Gassaway talks about situational awareness, which is see the bad things before they happen to you. So proper lighting can prevent us from having injuries, to see the bad guy before he or she hurts us, to see that angry dog in the backyard that, you know, maybe just as scared of us that comes at us when we jump the fence doing our 360 degree size up, you know, to not step in that hole that was right there next to us that we didn't see, to not slip, trip, or fall, all these different reasons why we need proper lighting. But let's guess what type of incidents we get hurt at the most because of not having proper lighting. Hint, hint, if you've taken a state test, the answer is right in front of you. It would be residential structure fires. Now, you may not know this, and this doesn't apply to the whole world. We'll just focus on statistics from the United States, but approximately 60,000 firefighters got hurt in 2018. That's a lot of injuries. Now, we, we're always saying, well, you know, firefighters are not getting killed in fires that much anymore. We had, I think, right at 50 line of duty deaths last year, which is a dramatic reduction than what we had before. And we're still suffering from the main causes, which is overexertion, medical strain. And we're still getting killed, sadly, out there on the interstates and the roadways. But you need to understand that injury-wise, we are more than likely to get hurt on the fire ground than anywhere else. Non-fire ground injuries were only around anywhere between 4,000 to 12,000 injuries out of those 60,000 injuries. We did get hurt during training. We did get hurt in non-fire emergency incidents. And we did get hurt, I'm sure you've experienced this, in other on-duty activities. You know what that means? That means slip, trip, or fall from uh, horseplay. Uh, I slipped off the truck. Um, I was in the bedroom changing a light bulb when really we were having a wrestling match with our coworker or whatever it was, and we ended up getting hurt. I know none of you have ever had that happen. But in general, they, that's how we get hurt. This comes from the U.S. Fire Injury Report from the NFPA. If you'd like to look any of this up, I'll give you a works cited page at the end because I'm not smart enough to give you this data out of my head. I share all this from basically research and any kind of report we could find that was backed up with literature reviews and it was well cited and peer reviewed. Now, those injuries on the fire ground, out of 18,000 of those injuries, 46% of them happen inside the fire ground, inside the actual incident, the building itself. But more injuries happened outside. You would think it would be the reverse. I think just me personally, when I'm inside the fire, my guard is up, I'm focused, I'm trying to look for things that can hurt me. And when we're outside, we get a little bit more complacent. And at night, we can't see as well. And if we don't have proper lighting, we could slip, trip, or fall, step on a power line, or God knows what. So it's really important from, if we look at this comprehensively, we have proper lighting in each role, each context, 
from outside the incident, from the driver, the incident commander, to the firefighter, to the EMS professional, to the police officer, everybody needs to be able to see. And if, you, if you're like me and you're 45 years old and learning about the value of, hey, my eyesight's not what it used to be, you know, being able to see is pretty darn important. So let's make sure we can see clearly and fulfill the mission. Unfortunately, those patterns of injuries are predictable. 89% of them were while we were fighting structure fires. Now, inside or outside, like you saw, those could happen. But something as simple as this picture here, you see the, the child in the corner, you're going to make the rescue, but we don't see the stairs right there in front of us that we're about to fall down or the hole in the floor. Um, the majority of these injuries occurred, like I said, at residential structure fires. Everybody's focused on the big incident, the commercial fires. The When we talk about line of duty deaths like the Charleston 9 or Wooster Cold Storage or, you know, when Brett Tarver or, or Jeff Bowen passed away, they were all in these large scale incidents. We get hurt every day on the things we do every day. So you run a lot more of these smaller scale incidents, and that's where we, we have a higher risk in them. And here's the sad thing. If any of you have been hurt before, you understand this painfully as much as I do. One third of these injuries resulted in time off from work to recover. If COVID-19 taught us anything, if you depend on more than one salary to survive, like most firefighters, time off from work and not being able to work your sideline is a big deal to your family. So we can prevent a lot of this just by putting proper lighting in place to see those things, to fulfill the oath and not get hurt. Uh, if we talk about how those are associated with poor lighting, slip, trip, or fall, 13% of them. I missed a step. Something hit me in the head or contact with an object. We were struck or assaulted by a person, animal, or object. You think might, it might have been valuable to see that coming, to have a proper you know, panoramic light or focused light, excuse me, to be able to see that danger before it actually happens to us. Here you can see the fire coming out of that room and coming up the side of the stairs, but you can't see over in that far right-hand corner, but that leads us to be a little bit more complacent. So being able to see is a big deal. And most of you know, I'm a thermal imaging guy. That's what I focus on. But I have, you know, just being blatantly honest with you, I have focused a little too much on the things I can't see in infrared versus understanding how my eye works, how proper lighting works. So one of the things I'm trying to work on in 2020 and 2021 is the areas I'm deficient in my knowledge. And lighting is a big deal. How we see and how we see the environment, how our eyes do that and process that information to basically determines how we're going to actually go to work. So being able to detect, recognize, and identify that stuff is very important. And if you break all those injuries down, over 30-something thousand injuries out of over a four-year period on the fire ground injury report, you can find three areas where we messed up a bunch. We got hurt in fire development, in smoky conditions, and slippery surfaces. Now, I'm clumsy enough with the lights on where I can see well. Now you're going to put me somewhere where I can't see, and I got danger around me and possible slippery surfaces. What's the chance that I'm going to get hurt? Pretty high. How can we prevent that or reduce that? I'm not going to say we can stop it 100%. But we can prevent or reduce those injuries by being able to see those bad things before we actually fall into them. And this comes out of another research paper that breaks it all down. And I like little pie charts instead of graphs because, you know, firefighters like food. So we talk about pie. So let's talk about common factors in all those injuries. What do you think the most common factor is? Not being able to what? See or see well. Inability to see potential hazards. Depth perception. How many of you have experienced the joy of, hey, I can't judge distances like I used to, or some of us can't see close up versus some of us can't see far away. My, my distance vision is failing, so I have to have glasses to help me see far away. Now you go into an environment that obscures that, and you have basically stuff between you and the area you want to go that's interfering with your vision, such as smoke, moisture, things that what we call atmospheric attenuation or interference that get in the way of your eyes being able to see. So let's look at this short little video of firefighters forcing entry and going from clear visibility into limited visibility and see if you see a common factor of what we all do or are we're all guilty of, including me.
how many picked up on that when we first went in our flashlights weren't on and how many picked on when we picked up when we went in only two of the firefighters had their flashlights on and how many picked up that all three firefighters were standing up now we are taught what if we can't see our feet we need to be down low and truth be told we need to be down low nine times out of ten just because visibility is better it's cooler down there we can see the people we're looking for but we get older we get in a hurry we get complacent and we're all guilty of this including me i'm not picking on these guys because i love these guys and i i've done this and have done it and probably will mess up tomorrow and do it but point being is if we can't see well what would happen if i'd open that door and there would have been a hole in the floor i didn't see I fell through a hole in the floor in 2015 and I was standing in perfectly clear, visible, good conditions. It cost me six months out of work and almost my job. My wife had to carry me to the bathroom for two months because I couldn't walk. All I fell was 18 inches. Imagine falling six to eight feet. You know, that's not something we want to do. So let's talk about light. That's what you're here to learn about, right? Lighting and lights and flashlights and how all that works. Well, how is light measured to begin with? Those of you who are uh, friends of mine online who study fire behavior, you've probably read the report on the, the history of the candle or the evolution of the candle. It's really neat when you get into how that works and how fire and combustion and, and how it draws air in. And it's, it's pretty intense. But the thing we don't talk about besides the energy produced is how is that distributed and how can you see? Well, one candle can in ratings is something you hear something called one candela or one lux which means one lux can illuminate which is one lumen one square meter of area now how well it illuminates that hmm, that's kind of a subjective measurement because we'll look at some pictures of what one lumen 20 50 lumens 100 lumens and you know, that, that can be a little subjective in that and, and my friends here have taught me that Unfortunately, just like a lot of other manufacturers, we know in other fire service markets, we self-certify things, which means we say how good it is. And that can be a little dangerous when I'm selling something and I say, hey, I say how good it is instead of a third party saying how good it is. So when we look at the amount of light falling a surface, that's measured in units called lux. How much area or how much light falls in one square meter? Adequate lighting is actually rated between 500 and 1,000 lux measured 30 inches above the floor. So lux equals lumens per square meter. And to give you something to relate to, if you remember a 100 watt bulb, that gives you 1600 lumens. That's a lot of light. Well, let's talk about how that light works and how we can work. So if you're working, like most of us, you do everything from hanging out at home to working in an office to working at the fire station. Well, how much lighting is needed to do your job? These are actual ratings from an actual lighting report. And it talks about if you're in a public space with dark surroundings, you need between 20 to 50 lux. Not very much. But when you get into things like what we do as firefighters, like working in a command vehicle or a command post, you need 200 to 500 lux. If you're working in an area of medium contrast or small size, like maybe outside at a, a small accountability board or working on a patient inside of a motor vehicle accident at night, you need between 1,000 and 2,000 lux. When you're working in, on a small size area, in an area of low contrast, which means I can't see detail over a long period of time, look how much more I need, 2,000 to 5,000 lux. And if I'm in very prolonged and exacting visual task, like a surgeon, we need lots and lots of light between 5,000 and 10,000 lux. And a lot of people are going, well, what does that mean? Well, let's, let's look at that. 50 lux means I can see three square feet or 50 lumens. So when you look at your flashlights and all the things you buy, this gives you an experientially relevant example. When we talk about performance of a visual task, like a medium, small, medium or small size task, like rescuing a victim in low visibility, that means 100 to 200 lumens. Now you're starting to say, okay, I bought XYZ flashlight and it says it got up to this many lumens. Now we're starting to get where we can put these pieces in our puzzle together and say, all right, I need this much light to be able to see. Now, granted, 100 to 200 lumens is rated in a perfect environment with not smoke and not a lot of things between you and the target. So think about that rating when we move through this stuff. And this picture I've got for you here, something I do in my thermal imaging classes, this is a set of stairs in zero visibility. Even with flashlights, the firefighters miss these stairs. 
Is that acceptable to you? You want to guess why we missed the stairs? We're standing up and we're not doing what we're supposed to, which is staying down, sweeping with our feet and our, and our arms and using that light to stay low. So even if you have a poor flashlight, you might be able to see better than no flashlight or a flashlight and standing up. Because when you stand up, you're in faster moving smoke, more heat, more moisture, and lots of things to obscure your vision. So let's break that down. Whoops. For some reason, we went a little fast there. We talk about different types of tasks and different types of lighting. Our friends here who have probably been experiencing such things as USAR deployments or extended operational incidents longer than 12 hours, large fire incidents, multiple alarms, uh, extended things like hazmat scenes. You would need lots of light because you don't know how long you're going to be there and you're going to need light for various things, like for work, like for reading, like for walking between command posts and another tent or restroom or the food area or the rehab area or to the hot, warm and cold zone. All those needed need to be lit up appropriately. That's where we need a lot of light, a lot of different types of lights. And we need to make sure those lights are going to last and be able to provide the type of light we need when we need it. So they got to be able to perform. We talk about when that rating I showed you earlier, medium contrast incidents. Here's a couple of examples from Fox Fury here. They gave some great photos. This is a, a patient on the roadway versus someone at a command board working at a UAS incident. That's the different types of lights you need. And some of these lights are adjustable. You have them where they can actually deflect off of things. You can pan the light down or up. And that's important because a lot of times you can actually have too much light for different types of incidents because i've heard this more often than not from firefighters that light's too darn bright well why is it too bright well because i'm looking right at it well maybe we shouldn't be looking right at it maybe we should change the angle so here's a couple examples for you you also could consider an engineer or driver at a pump panel or operating a motor vehicle accident where you're extricating a patient or doing patient care that's what's considered a medium contrast incident we can still see can't see perfectly well, but we can see well enough to do our job. Low contrast incidents, these can be bad deals. It's like confined space, crawling down a dark, smoky hallway. Uh, this is a picture from, uh, from CMC Rescue where they're working in a confined space incident. Obviously, this is well lit because this is actual training incident. But if you're going underground in a manhole cover or into a, you know, a trench or something like that, you may not have that benefit. So you're going to be working in very, very poor conditions, and you're going to need extremely bright light focused on the area you're working so you can see. So those are some examples of that. Now, here's something that a lot of us don't think about. All we think about is the light bright enough or is it too bright and is it going to hold up? There's a lot of other things that come into play when we talk about the human body and us. Glare is an issue. Something How bright something is can actually interfere with how we see the object. If you've ever had the misfortune of someone shining a bright light in your face or going from a dark room and stepping outside in the beautiful sunshiny day, you've experienced something known as a star effect or disability glare. So that glare affects you for a few seconds, few moments or longer, depending on your eyesight and the condition, that ad adaptation from going from one room to another or one area, uh, area of light to another area of light can take a while for our eye to adapt from constricted to dilated or vice versa. It can cause annoyance and discomfort and can also cause you to not be able to see well. For example, there's a person standing at the top of the stairs here. Can you see the person? No, but you can see the light. But when we talk about light in general, we don't even think about stuff like this. This is an interesting factoid because I'll bet you this little fact will convict most of you because it convicted me. How many times have you walked through the fire station? whether in the day room when they got the lights off and they're watching TV or they're laying in their cubicle, getting ready to go to bed. And you see that soft glow or bright glow of the not so smartphone. Why do I say not so smartphone? Because if we look at that long enough, one, it can disrupt our sleep, which is not good Two, If we look at it incorrectly, laying in there in very dark conditions, half of our face covered up because we're tired looking at it, we can actually experience something called transient smartphone blindness or dark adaptation. So you can get up out of the bed, put the phone down, and all of a sudden be blind for up to 15 minutes. This has occurred to numerous people across the world. This is just caused by using your smartphone, covering up one eye like you're laying on a pillow and looking at the phone at night. And you're like, well, what does that got to do with me? 
what if you're the driver of my fire engine or my fire ladder truck at night or you're driving the ambulance at night? Do you think that's going to affect you when you get up out of the bed for a call or you get up out of that day room when you've been sitting in the dark? So just think about how your eye works, and we're going to get into that more. I love this little cartoon where it shows the moth talking to the ambulance driver. He says, personally, I was drawn to it. I did a lot of reading on emergency lighting and can a light be too bright? And if you look into some of these uh, reports we have at the end, you'll find that some of the LED lights when they first came out were anywhere between five to 20 times exponentially brighter than they needed to be. And that was at night. Daytime, not so much. But at nighttime, it actually had a negative effect. It actually draw impaired drivers to the light causing accidents or it caused the actual drivers going by not be able to see for a brief moment and then they ended up hitting something. So there is a downside to emergency vehicle lighting being too bright. And some states now have laws on day and night modes on how those lights actually function. Uh, they have different uh, strobe ratings and flashes per minute. And there's a lot of research about how those can cause seizures and seizure-like activity in people who are sensitive to that. And I have the reports at the end of this if you'd like to go deeper in the weeds on that. But for us, what you need to understand is the same light that draws an impaired driver or sleepy driver towards a motor vehicle accident where we have two ladder trucks, an extrication squad, an ambulance, and a police officer, and they're drawn towards the light and they crash into it is the same effect that can draw an impaired person who is under the effects of carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide who's wanting to get out of there, but they can't get out. And all of a sudden this bright light comes towards them and they're drawn to it. It's called a phototaxis effect. It happens in animals and people. So when I hear firefighters say, yeah, that light's too bright. You can't have too bright of a flashlight in a smoke filled environment. You can have too light, too bright of a flashlight in other incidents like EMS, motor vehicle accidents, and other contexts. But when you're in an environment where you're constantly fighting to be able to see and work because of the environment, you need more light from focus to panoramic views and high, medium, and low. So think about that when you're looking for someone, the brighter the light and the further it goes, the more chances they're going to see that light. And they're going to turn their face towards that light, raise their hands up in that startle effect, be able for you to find them. So be the light in the darkness that they're drawn to is my challenge to you. Don't get caught up in that. Well, they, man, you know, my senior firefighter said that light's too bright. I'm not going to put that on there. No, you, you need to have a light that is very, very bright and adjustable, but you also need to have lights that do different things. But when we're in an environment where they, they think we're coming, they can't see us either. So don't think that your gear that's got all those reflective striping is going to stand out in zero visibility. You need all the light you can so you can be the light they're drawn to. So let's talk about how your eye works in all this madness. Here's the cool things I learned about the human body. Whether you're a, a evolutionist or a creation guy like me, you'll understand that your eye has two types or really, really three types of vision, but two main ones we're going to talk about. Photopic vision and scotopic vision. Well, what is that and why should I care? I'm a firefighter. I'm coming to work. Well, here's why you should care. Because under well-lit conditions, your eyes are using what's called photopic vision. Like sitting here in my office with the lights on and talking to you, I can see really well. Your eye uses what's known as cone cells. They see detail and color really, really well. But when you turn the lights off and you have poorly lit conditions, your eyes use rod cells. Rod cells are located on the peripheral portion of your eye. You know what happens when the lights go off? You actually, your peripheral vision actually improves. Now you don't see color well, but it's one of those things like, oh, why does my peripheral vision improve in the dark? So you don't get eaten or attacked by the bad guy, because you can see those things coming from your right or left. They're more sensitive also to movement. See where I'm going with this? So in the dark, our eyes are already trying to see right or left of us better and pick up on slight movement. If you ever watched a police officer do a, uh, a little follow my flashlight test, that's something they do with a, a trick with your eyes to see if the outside edges of your eyes twitch. And if they twitch too much, they can tell you have you've been impaired so the same effect is what we're looking for our the rods are more sensitive to movement so we can see things that are on the right or left of us in the dark a little bit better so here's two examples from fox fury they've given us here 
in photopic or excuse me, scotopic or poorly lit conditions. We have a person standing at the top of the stairs where we're shining the light on them. You'll notice you see more of a silhouette effect. You have a focused beam that starts to break apart and starts to scatter as it gets closer to the target. And then when we get closer to that individual, you can see them better. So the distance does make a difference, but the overall darkness or absence of light in that environment is what affects our eyes. Now, I want you to watch this quick little video when we're looking towards one of my firefighters and there's a light in front of him that outlines him. Notice when the light goes away and when the light comes back and tell me, do you see any color? Do you see any detail of the firefighter or do you just see a shadow and the outline of a silhouette saying that is a firefighter? You don't know who it is, but you know it's a firefighter. And why is that important? Right here, you can see the bright light on the back side of the firefighter illuminating his silhouette. Now, when you're looking for a person in poorly lit conditions, you may not see what color of clothes they're wearing. You don't know, you don't care whether they're uh, what race they are, what gender they are. You just know I am looking for someone that I'm supposed to save. And what you're looking at is the shadow of a person. And this helps you because you can identify who they are. There's somebody I need to help. And that's what we're there to do. But when we understand how light works and more importantly, how our eye works, we're not going to see color very well. We're not going to see detail very well, but we can see things like, as I told you a little bit ago, movement. And we can see the outside edges of this picture a lot better than we thought we could because our peripheral vision has increased. So in these poorly lit conditions, our eyes are already doing something for us. So why is this important to you? Because when you transition from one environment to another, that effect on your eyes can mess you up or mess me up or mess us all up. So let's think about going from a dark bedroom to a brightly lit fire truck to a dark outside to uh, lights as we go in the door to darkness inside of a smoke filled environment. Each time our eyes have to adjust and have to adjust. And there's a period between that adjustment where we can and have missed things like the victim, like the fire, like I dropped something or I missed the door that, to the room I needed to search. So when we transition from these poorly lit conditions to bright conditions, we have to watch out on how that affects our eyes. In poorly lit conditions, obviously our peripheral vision improves, but our distance and detail diminishes. So we need what's called a minimum of a two-phased approach to lighting. Okay, and we're going to talk about what that is. A two-phased approach is we have a peripheral light or panoramic light. You can do that with a headlamp where it makes more of a 180 degree light in front of you. And then you have a focused or a distance light, like a right angle light that reaches out and sees the target far off. We use that to highlight things. So this, this short little video, you can see the two differences of a headlamp that's producing a peripheral effect, which has got a glow around us, giving us about a three foot, two and a half foot light of where I'm at and wherever my head goes, the light goes. That's why I love headlights. And then the, the focus light or distance light is my right angle light. As you see, as we scan around with our headlamp, I can see directly in front of me. I can see my friend John Dixon, or excuse me, John Davis, who's wearing the Euro helmet. Don't pick on him for that. And then you can see the focus light of the right angle light and how that transitions from a bright fire room where it's not so bright to when we move into a dark room where it's very intense. If you look right here at this image, you can see the power of this light in darkness. Look at how it's lighting up this box or this crib area next to the firefighter. So you have a well-lit area because of the right angle light. And then you see the fire around the left-hand corner and you see the silhouette or shadow of a firefighter in a not so well-lit area. So we're transitioning from one area to the other. So how do we fix that where our eyes are not taking a beating? So we need to be able to detect, recognize, and respond to what we see. So a wide angle light is critical at night because scotopic vision is already, we're already there. We're in poorly lit conditions. Our eyes are changing so we can see that peripheral, but we can't see detail very well. 
So a soft glow of a panoramic wide angle light is going to help us a lot. Now, a focused distance light will help us to see out where we're going. But we also need to be able to recognize what we saw. Hey, there's something there. What is it? So when you see people say that's a good light, okay, well, how good is it? Well, what do you mean? When I'm looking out there in the distance or looking off to see that, you can detect something's there possibly, but can you truly tell what it is? Because a good light is going to illuminate it enough for you to actually detect, recognize, and respond to it. So such as a warning light on the back of your SCBA flashing when you're down, that tells you, hey, that's where that firefighter's at. Or like I have this little red illuminated flashing LED bulb on the back of my Fox Fury headlamp that tells my firefighters where I'm at. This comes from the Risk Reduction for Emergency Response by the Federal Signal Safety Corporation. So how does all those things come together? Well, guess what? There's a lot more factors that affect our peripheral vision, such as contrast. And guess what? As we get older, our ability to actually differentiate contrast and color gets worse. So the 20-year-old on your fire truck actually has an advantage over the 45-year-old, that's me, if they got the eagle eyesight and I don't. So remember, they may not have the experience, but they got the eyes. Trust what they tell you they see. The visual workload makes a difference. Whether you know this or not, there's lots of research on stress and how much information we're trying to process. Let me ask you a question. When you show up on the fire ground, you come off the truck with incomplete information at best, and you're going somewhere you've never been before, and you transition from the truck to the front door to go in and possibly make a rescue, how many things do you see in that 30 to seconds to two minutes and how many, how many things are you thinking about and doing in that 30 seconds to two minutes? And how fast are you moving? Because here's something that shocked me. The faster we move, our peripheral vision decreases. So if you're, if you're in a vehicle for every 10 miles an hour, it can decrease as much as 30 degrees. Well, if you want to know what that means in firefighter speak, you normally see 155 to 170 degrees left to right. You put on your Scott or MSA face piece, it drops to about 110 degrees. Now I'm going to lose 30 degrees so I can go down to 70 degrees. That means the outside edges of that incident are gone. And then when I'm stressed out, they've proven, read Dr. Uh, Grossman's work. The lieutenant colonel in the military wrote a book called On Combat. He talks about different conditions all the way up to condition black. When you get to a certain heart rate and a certain stress, you start to have auditory exclusion you start to have the deterioration of being able to do things like tie knots and uh, basically dexterity, and you get tunnel vision. So you don't see very well left or right wide. So all these things tax us and affect us long before, no matter what flashlight we're using. So when your body's stressed, the pupil dilates to allow more light in so you can see potential threats. However, high levels of adrenaline can cause blurry vision. There we go again, losing detail. This is another great picture, an example of that scotopic vision where we have the outline of the shadow of the firefighter flowing water at a large scale incident. This is from a good friend of mine, Captain JP Soto, who's an amazing photographer. So let's look at something that is rather convicting for me that taught me something in this process. Now, you people that are on the call that know me, I love thermal imaging cameras. Well, guess what? Here's where a thermal imaging camera actually hurts my vision. We're in darkness in an actual incident, and we're watching over two firefighters who are fighting a fire. What happens when I put a really bright, super awesome thermal imaging camera in front of my face? What do you think I lose? Well, let's watch and see. Notice how clear the thermal imaging camera is. You can see a little bit to my right, but does anybody know there's a firefighter immediately to my left? And I can't see him at all. Right there, I saw a little bit of him. And then there's the light from another firefighter. And that's real time. Now we're going to slow it down. Always do things two, two times. What are we focused on? It's like my daughter and her tablet. I am zoned in on this picture. And I'm not looking at everything behind me. You notice a little red dot keeps showing up? Somebody behind us playing with the laser pointer on the Drager camera and don't realize they're highlighting me as I'm holding this. So yes, light is a good thing, but if you put it in the wrong place for too long, you can actually focus in on something and the background can be blurred out and you don't see it. 
So keep in mind that our lights have an effect on how we see, and we don't need to look at one thing too long because our eyes have to adjust. Because how long it takes to adjust can be very, very varied based on our age and conditions. So during good conditions, like photopic vision, right here where I got one of my instructors leading three firefighters into a training we're doing, it can happen in less than five minutes, and some people even faster. But according to the FAA and a lot of pilots research, at night, it can take up to 30 minutes for us to transition to scotopic vision. Do you have 30 minutes when you show up at a working fire or a, a incident with 10 people trapped in a bus that's overturned? No, you don't. You've got to adapt very quickly. So how do we change that? We cheat because in between those three areas is something called mesopic vision. That's the in-between. That's not poorly lit. That's not super bright. It's like an ambient lighting conditions. So mesopic vision is a combination of the two. So how do we stay in that? Because generally in most nighttime environments, there's enough ambient light to prevent true scotopic vision. So there's enough light to stop it. So we don't need to be in total darkness and we don't need to be in super bright light. So when we transition from the fire truck to off onto the ground and into the incident, what do we need to have around us? A certain amount of light. Remember in the beginning, I asked you those firefighters when they made entry, did they have their lights on? No, they didn't. But they turned them on as soon as they came in. You know what I've learned as an ADD or ADHD OCD firefighter who's been on a long time now, and I, I hate to say that because it makes me feel old, but I've learned if I don't do something initially, I don't do it later. So if I don't turn the flashlight on before I go into the incident, I'm in there fumbling around saying, man, I should have turned that light on, but now nah, I can't find it now, or I can't get my finger on the button, or, or I've dropped it, or something's happened. I don't get to it. If I interrupt my pattern of behavior, I don't go back to it. So let's stay in that mesopic vision right there in the middle ground, that middle range. This is an example of that. We got smoke around us. We can see okay. We've got three lights between the two of us. This is called a multi-light approach rather than one single light. And that might be the firefighter behind you, illuminating you along with your light, helping you see. And what I, what I advocate is you don't just take everything I, I tell you today as the gospel. Here's what I tell you to do. Go get you three different flashlights, helmet light, right angle light, box light. We'll go in this in the next webinar series. I want you to go in different contexts and different environments and work as a crew, not just by yourself, and see, A, how that three light up approach works when you're in smoke and then see how that approach works and can be actually contraindicated by me getting on too close to you shine the light in your face and how i should change the angle of that light okay make sure you do that don't just buy the light and say i can see well my my headlamp i have on my light on my helmet there if i don't angle it up my firefighters will turn and look at me and say hey i'll talk to you but you got to turn off that choo-choo light because it's blinding me I see great, but when they look at me, they see nothing but they think, hey, go into the light. The end is near. It's that bright. Helps me is not helping them. So make sure you understand how that works and affects the people who are working with you because you don't want to blind them. So before we go into this Q&A and show you a video of transitioning between photopic and scotopic conditions and why you need a good flashlight, here's what I want you to think about. Everybody knows that I'm into thermal imaging cameras. In 22 years, in my department, I've never brought out anybody who was alive. They've all been dead until two years ago. And we brought out a, a poor little boy who, thank God, made it. And that little boy, we got to go meet six months later and make him an honorary firefighter. You know what didn't work the day I went to go in there with my crew that rescued him? My thermal imaging camera died. You know what didn't? Quit. My two firefighters, and they had flashlights on. And one of them scanned the lower bunk bed, saw a clump of what looked like a blanket, sweeped it and sweeped up six-year-old Tremaine and brought him out. And he's still alive today. So some of the most basic things we take for granted are fundamental skills and a flashlight, for example, can make a big difference. In my experience, as much as I love a thermal imaging camera, the more technological it is, the more bells and whistles it has, the more chance it's going to fail. The more simple it is, the more beautiful it is. I want you to watch as these firefighters transition into this environment. And there's four of us, but only two of us 
have a flashlight on. And I'm going to challenge you a little bit later about this. Uh, and I want you to think about why they don't have their lights on. But notice how quickly the conditions change and why you need a good light. Because this is the type of environment firefighters face. Notice how the conditions changing. You can see his right angle light lighting up the firefighter in front of him. I have on a helmet light. You're seeing my helmet cam view as we transition through the front door into the living room. Notice how quickly we go to scotopic conditions where all we see is a glow. Do you want to just have one flashlight in this? Imagine if all of the firefighters had proper lighting, what kind of conditions we'd be able to have. The, the brightest light you're seeing is from the glow of the thermal imaging camera. That should not be the case. All right, so we are at, uh, I believe, right at 45 minutes or so. I believe at this point, Chris would like to uh, open up and have a few questions, answers, and talk about a few things. Chris, Chris would you like me to uh, stop the presentation so you can just have video? Um, yeah, we can do that. All right. Uh, we had some uh, questions coming through the chat while you were speaking. That was really, really good information. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, Wim is asking about, you know, what's going to be the best light to cut through smoke. Um, you know, he asked about the, uh, you know, the effect of your car lights looking mm -hmm. through fog and all you see is, you, know, you just see the fog. You don't see anything through there. Um, so what's your suggestions on the best kind of light to go through smoke? Okay, so first of all, consider the type of light. A headlight is gonna illuminate left, right, and a certain distance in front of it based on the bulb and the deflector behind it, angling that light outwards. Whereas if you're a hunter and you have a scope on your rifle, without the scope, you can't see very far to aim at whatever target you're looking for. With a scope, you have a very focused, magnified spot. If I want to see far off from where I am, do I need a floodlight or do I need a focused narrow beam light that has a very, very long beam distance in testing and under the criteria, because that testing's done, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, in ambient conditions, not in a fire. So if my light says it can see 600 feet or 800 feet, which I'm not going to be in an average 800 foot house, when I go in conditions that are really, really poor, such as a CrossFit gym on fire with tires and mats, you're in the worst kind of smoke you can be in. Therefore, you would want a very tight, very bright right angle light. So high lumen count, upwards of three to 400 lumens, and we'll talk about the differences of that here in a minute, and a, a very, very focused beam. And how that affects it is that beam doesn't actually cut through smoke, okay? Light go, permeates or goes through things based on what's stopping or reflect, reflect, refracting, refracting, reflecting, and absorbing the light. So what type of smoke is it? Is it wet smoke? Is it nasty, turbulent black smoke? Is it light, hazy smoke? Light, hazy smoke, I might be able to have a long distance beam, see a long way, or if I got tires burning, I can have a NASA space light and not see very far. So it really depends on the context, but I want something that has a long beam distance and a very tight beam that allows me to see further. Chris, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, no, that sounds, that's about perfect. I mean, the only thing that you might talk about too, though, is uh, technique that where you're positioned in the smoke and that might yes, be a conversation, but, you know. I agree. <laughs> getting low probably helps a lot. Well, and we talked about this in some of our talks before. The biggest problem with flashlight use is not the flashlight, it's the person holding it, just like I talk about in camera usage. If I stand up, in a high heat environment with a thermal imaging camera, it's blowing smoke and moisture on the lens and then it, it accumulates and the camera can't see anything. If I stand up with a super bright, best flashlight I could get into the worst conditions where if I drop down to one knee or get down and turn that, that light sideways on the floor where the atmosphere is better, I'm gonna see things such as, hey, there's the foot of this couch. There's, there's four claw feet on that couch. 
There's four uh, legs of a chair. Uh, there's four legs of a table. Okay, I'm in a great room. And oh, look, there's a person on the floor. And last time I checked, we don't find victims on the ceiling. They're typically four foot and down unless they're in a bunk bed. So being able to stay low and see in those conditions with a focused beam, long distance light, a right angle light, not so much the headlamp or a box light, that's going to make the difference. Just think about this. Which one's going to be able to make a difference in a fight? A pocket knife or a 50 caliber with a sniper rifle? A pocket knife, I got to get close to somebody I don't want to fight. A 50 caliber sniper rifle, I can see the problem way off and take it out. You want something that's going to see that target way, way out and be able to get it. What else you got, sir? Uh, that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Reading the chats here. I think he was asking brands. I'm not going to focus on brands as much as I am criteria. Wim, I want you to think about this. I'm a criteria-based person. I'm not a brand-based person. So when you go get, I, I would challenge you to read the criteria I'm going to give you at the end of this webinar, then go pick two to three flashlights that say they have those criteria. And then I want you to take it and suggest and, and test it in different environments, fog, smoke. You're talking about a white wall in, in fog. Why are you seeing a white wall? What's in fog? Moisture, lots of moisture. What does moisture do to light? Absorbs it, reflect, ref, refracts that word I keep having trouble with, reflects it, absorbs it. So the different brands will have different beams, distances and different beam angles. You won't know that until you test it. And I would give you, at the end, I'll give you a comparison of three different lights that can help you out if that makes sense. Okay, he says that's better. Hopefully I didn't muddy up the water too much. <laughs> no, I think that was good. Um, I think we're pretty good on the questions. Um, if you wanna continue, we can keep rolling along here. Sure, just let me know if we, we missed something or someone, I wanna make sure we have time to cover those, okay? So, the three-phase approach to lighting. Helmet light, some type of helmet light in the center, wherever you look, or you could have one of those lights that you see that people clamp on the side, that works as well. Just, we'll talk about concerns with both of those and what you need to watch out for. Uh, a right angle light gives you beam distance, as he was asking about, being able to see targets, identify objects, and something that he, he illuminated, you know, pun intended, in his uh, statement, I see nothing but a white wall. Well, and I'm crawling in smoke with that type of light. I can see that white wall moving. And those of you who are on here are into fire behavior, that movement can indicate a lot of things that we're going to get into in the part two series of the webinar, reading smoke and how that can help us and tell us where we are, where we need to go, and a lot of other information. A box light, however, typically firefighters have that mounted or strapped to their right or left hand side down low can be used for a lot of things, allows you to find one another, can mark entrances or egresses, and can scan the floor right around me and give me situational awareness of things I may have missed. So here's the thing I wanted to challenge you in the beginning. This is one of our training incidents, and this throws myself under the bus because this is one of my instructors in here as well. Four people go into this burn building. How many flashlights do you see turned on? How many flashlights do you see turned on? None. And one of my guys has on plenty of lights. You want to know why we don't turn on flashlights? Here's something that's going to hurt. All three, all these firefighters have tools, GoPros, helmet cams, thermal imaging cameras. You know how many times I've been to training and they give us a scenario and they tell us we can't use our flashlights because that would be cheating because you'd be able to see what we're trying to hide from you. What are we doing to firefighters when we tell them not to use their light every time they come to training? What do you think they're going to do on a real fire? They're not going to use it. You know how many times I've done training across the United States, Canada, Germany, and firefighters had flashlights on and they didn't turn it on? And I asked them why they didn't turn it on. You know what they said? I didn't know if I was allowed to use it. 
is that a really bad statement, but a true one at the same time? It's a universal problem in our culture. We have equipment. It's on us, but we don't want to turn it on because we were trained not to use it because that would make the training or make the incident we were doing too easy. I don't think the military turns off their equipment when they're going after a bad guy. They use everything they got to get the bad guy. We should use everything we got to get the good guy. So here's a simple little infographic of why you need a multi-phase approach. Whether you have a helmet lamp like I have, or you have one of those side lights you see firefighters mount on the side of their helmet, that's your first two parts there. You see your panoramic view around your eyes. And that's to his point, he was asking that question. I do see a white wall with that light. But if I focus right directly in front of me, which is what that light is for, I can see where my hands reach. That's, the light is not to pierce through the smoke as it is to give me a medium contrast, medium task right in front of me working light. And I can use it for smoke reading because it tilts upwards. A right angle of light, or what he was asking about, allows me to look ahead, to scan, to see specific targets or points of interest. I can look under beds. I, if you flip it and hang it upside down in your coat, it's actually easier to do that with. A box light can scan the floor. You can look for life, fire, and layout. A lot of classes teach that simple little acronym, including our own. Where's the victim or where might they be? Where's the fire and what's the layout of the structure? And more importantly, this gives me almost 180 degree area anywhere between three feet to as much as 10 to 15 feet out in front of me illuminated in portions depending on the context in the environment, the type of smoke, or you're crawling in a bi-directional flow, an exhaust, an intake, all the different things that we could crawl in, that's going to change how that light is affected, how much moisture is in the smoke, how thick, optically dense the smoke is, that's going to change that. So there's no perfect light for that. But I would tell you that it, would do, it does a disservice to buy something without testing it or going to someone who already has one and see how it performs. So when I talk about that helmet light, whether you have the right angle light or like we have here, the, the uh, Fox Fury helmet light, I like the helmet light in the center because it's basically focused wherever I'm looking and it gives me a panoramic view. And to quote him, uh, Wim, a little bit ago, he talked about that white wall. I see a white wall in front of me, but I also can see the hose line in front of me. I can turn around and see the firefighter right next to me. I can look at the floor. I can see all that well and it illuminates a good probably... 150 degree pattern in front of me and that flashing red light on the back of my helmet from that light gives my firefighters an idea of where I am and when they're searching the room I can see that red light pulsing a lot better than I can see the white light and it provides a wide field of view it's very beneficial when we talk about the advantages of a helmet light it's hands-free it's great the light goes where I look that can be a good thing and a bad thing if I look the right place if I look too much at the wrong thing I'm not going to see what I need to see. Most of them are extremely durable. The problem with a lot of them, though, however, they're not meant for high heat conditions. And if we do like we talked about in the beginning, we stand up and we're standing up when we're not supposed to, where's all the heat up top? Also, you need to think about where are the batteries on this thing? Are they in the front or in the back? They're in the front and batteries pop at 302 degrees Fahrenheit. And potassium hydroxide is now leaking down into your eyes or the side of your face. It's not real pleasant. So make sure it's a well-insulated, well-protected, durable light. And make sure it's balanced. Because think about all the things you're hanging off your helmet. You got a light. This guy's got goggles. Now you got a, a helmet cam on one side. You get off balance. That's a problem. And if you got too much hanging off of the light, you're crawling in environments where you got wires hanging down. You can hook your helmet on things. That The wonderful eagle we like on american style helmets has gotten hooked on a lot of things so we can become an entanglement hazard if we're not careful make sure it's functional not just pretty okay a right angle light very very bright needs to be needs to be adjustable needs to be extremely durable if it's going to be a firefighter's light because as they say the old joke you could put an anvil in a rubber room with two firefighters come back an hour later you'll find a broken anvil and two very frustrated firefighters who swore they did nothing. We can break everything. But do we need to intentionally break this stuff? No. We need to make sure we take care of our equipment, change the batteries out regular. Just like in the morning when you check your SCBA or your BA, I know that we got some uh, firefighters from overseas. We check our equipment, right? Check your equipment. 
If it's been a while since you've changed the batteries, change the batteries. Inspect the, the battery compartment. <clears throat> Check, make sure the light's actually working, right? Look for damage or corrosion in there. And I consider a flexible connection on your light instead of just a clip, because in my opinion, I can't scan back and forth in a 30 to 40 degree pattern wide enough with that right angle light, the way it's clipped on uh, Instructor Thomas here, as well as I could if it was something that I could move it around with. Just make sure it's not an entanglement hazard. It's one of the things we have to watch out for because Lord knows they keep adding more stuff that we got to carry into the fire to go rescue people. And they expect us to be flexible and movable. And now we got a flashlight, a thermal imaging camera. We got a pack tracker. <clears throat> I'm carrying a Halligan. This guy's carrying that. I mean, we're carrying everything but the victim. You know, we need to be able to have some ergonomics and the ability to move and, and at least have one hand free. So when you talk about lights in general, he was asking which one I should buy. Let's talk about the criteria to buy one rather than me tell you what brand it is. Because just to be brutally honest, majority of fire departments call me on a regular basis. Hey, which camera should I buy? I'm like, none of them. They're like, what? I said, no, I'm not going to give you an answer. I'm going to give you the criteria and you're going to make a decision because I'm not a salesman. I want you to understand that you need to test it and need to work for you because not every light not every camera, not every tool is going to work as well in every environment because ergonomics matter, the culture, the context matters, the cost matters, all those things matter. So if I'm buying a light, am I buying it for cost versus quality? When you get older, you understand that quality is worth the cost because I buy three of the cheap things in one year when I could have bought one of the good things, right? Here's a big big obstacle in a lot of fire departments and i know i i have this battle in my own and several other departments have is it an individual purchase or a department purchase and are you allowed to use equipment that you purchase individually on your municipal fire department because in my department if you get hurt wearing non-city issued gear like if i decide i like a particular brand of gloves better and i get hurt they have the right to deny my workers comp claim that's a big deal so you better research that before you start stacking all these tools and buying your own helmet and doing all this stuff. Because if I get hurt using something that's not issued by my department and not approved, mm, that may not work out too well for me. So, and how is your role affect the type of lighting? Are you a nozzleman? Are you a truck guy with the Halligan and you're forcing entry? Are you the engineer? Are you the company officer? That determines what type of light you need. Okay, the engineer outside needs a completely different set of lighting and types of lighting than the firefighter on the nozzle or the company officer behind two firefighters running back, moving hose, watching over them needs different types of lighting. And the biggest thing that, that is not considered in all of this when people purchase lights, not so much the firefighter purchase them, but say municipalities when they purchase them, how heavy is the darn thing? Is it ergonomic, which means do they like the way it feels? Because we're really weird. If we don't like the way it feels, we don't care how good it is. We'll leave it on the fire truck. Don't care how much you tell me I got to carry it. They'll write people up before they carry something they don't like. Is it a peripheral light that gives me good panoramic views left to right? Or is it a distance focus light? Do you know where I work? There's these certain brand of lights I will not name that gets left on the truck more often than not. Why? They don't like them. What are they carrying though? Their own light. I'd be carrying the one the city issued along with the one I like because it's like having a backup, some redundancy. So when you look at lighting, look at these different variables here because this affects your purchase and it's going to affect the performance. Now, lights are rated differently. And you, if you read the specs on these things, like when I read camera sheets, you'll see something called IP rating. And you'll see stuff that says IP65 up to IP68 or in that range, the first number of that IP means, is it protected from solids, from dust, intrusion? Six is the maximum. Okay, that's good, because you're in a dusty, nasty environment. The second number, however, is probably one of the more important, because what environment do we work in? We're there to put out what? The fire? What are we going to use to put it out? Water? Are we going to flow a lot of water? Yes. Is it going to probably get dropped in water? Yes. Does it need to be waterproof? Yes, 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 yes. This, the answer is C, you know, it, we, we need to be very, very durable and waterproof. So you need something that is water resistance or waterproof. So eight is the maximum. As you can see in this Fox Fury picture here, they've submerged it and it's working well. The rating, however, only gives us a partial picture of its durability. 
you want to look at things like what is it actually made of? Is it waterproof and does it float or does it sink? Why does that matter? Well, when you drop it off the side of fire boat 38 and it floats, that's a good thing. When it doesn't, I bet you're not going to put the dive gear on and go get it. So make sure you understand those things before you buy it. And how are they rated in overall brightness? This is the fun part. There's something called torch lumens and emitter lumens. And you're like, what is that? Here's what it is. Torch lumens is actually the practical rating. Emitter lumens is what the manufacturer says, the actual of light that comes out of it. Well, actual light that comes out of it is like saying, this nozzle flows 180 gallons a minute. Well, does it flow 180 gallons a minute well? And you're like, well, what, is it, what do you mean by that? Are you putting that water where it needs to be? Because it, is it a focused or wide angle light? Does it illuminate a wide area or a narrow area? Be careful of words like up to so many lumens because manufacturers self-certify that rating and that rating could be in the first five minutes, could be a few seconds or a few, could be a couple hours later. But in general, lumens deteriorate or drop or diminish as battery life fades. You'll see some of them have ratings called moonbeam equivalent, which means, oh, well, this flashlight can stay on for 20 hours in moonbeam mode. Well, moonbeam mode means barely neg negligible light. So torch lumens is what actually exit the, exits the light and is practical, such as this great little infographic they've given us from Fox Fury. See how we're rating the emitted lumens, which are going everywhere, versus the practical lumens, which are going where we need them to, to need them to go. The energy is reflected, absorbed, and lost in the hood and bezel of the lens, but the torch lumen measured from this point outward. It's going towards where I want it to go, focused on that target, focused on that child's hand, focused on, hey, that's a, that's a crib in that corner. So just be careful when you get caught up, oh, this thing's got a thousand lumens. Well, it may have it for five minutes, but it may not have that after 15 minutes. You need to know that by actually using the actual device. So overall brightness is a big deal when we're working in environments that have terrible, terrible visibility. So when they tell me it can't, it's, it's too bright, no, it can't be too bright if I'm in a smoke-filled, nasty environment with moisture and stuff falling down around me. Now, do I want an adjustable light? Yes, I think that's a good idea. When you talk about emergency vehicle lighting, that's a whole different category. They should have day and night modes because they produce some of their LEDs, like I said in the beginning, produce exponentially beyond the amount of light needed or required. And we talked about the phototaxis effect can have a negative effect on drivers. And in general, those friends of mine that say halogens are better than LEDs. Well, criteria and facts wise, that's not the case. LEDs outperform all handheld lights on every area out there. So if you like a halogen light better than LED, it's just because you like it and it's a personal preference. Like Ford and Chevrolet, I'm not going to change your mind on that. You just need to understand that that's the way the actual facts are. When he was asking about beam distance and how far you can see, this is a great infographic that Fox Fury has provided for us. The thing you want to understand about this, when I'm looking at a, at a target at 100 feet all the way up to 250 feet, how well can I see that target? You can see him just outside of that in the 300 feet range. But what you need to understand is this is at night outside. If you're searching for a lost person, that's great. But what about in that house fire? What about in that commercial building incident? What about in a warehouse that's got a sprinkler head activated and you got cotton bales on fire with the worst kind of smoke there is? You don't really have much fire, but you have the worst visibility you've got or can encounter. Your tick doesn't help you much. You need a lot of light and you're still only going to see so far. So let's quit blaming the flashlight and start thinking about the context of the environment and how we can apply that appropriately. So here's something that I learned the hard way and unfortunately several other firefighters have as well. Don't just shove any old battery in your flashlight. Don't mix brands. Uh, don't mix old and new because what you end up with is corrosion and moisture. And if you, and you can ask the manufacturer right here, if you have corrosion inside the battery compartment, that generally voids the warranty. So does it do any good to buy something with a lifetime warranty? And I do something it says not to do in the instructions and I avoid the warranty. No, I mean, it tells you not to do that. 
because you can actually cause them to leak in that case. So use the same brand, use what they recommend, whether it's an industrial grade, don't use dollar store batteries and expect million dollar results inside of the, the toughest environment you could be in. So make sure you're buying the right stuff for the right product and changing them based on the manufacturer's recommendations. How can you know all this? Here's the hard part. My wife is right. The world would be better if we would read the instructions. If you're going to spend your own hard-earned money to buy a flashlight or buy any type of equipment, do yourself a favor. Take 10 minutes, get a cup of coffee or your favorite beverage, read the instructions. I can't tell you how many times I have messed something up, including turnout gear and lots of other things in life because I failed to read the instructions. It's not that hard, but we are, we got the world's shortest attention span in history. It's 140 characters or less or three seconds on Facebook. And I don't want to read that. We got to dedicate the time. And when we talk about individual types of lighting in the second uh, webinar, we'll talk about role and context based. These are the types of lighting that's being used out there today. You got apparatus, mount, apparatus mounting, tripod or portable lights as an example, one of Fox Fury's tripod lights that I have. Personal lights, which we hammered on a lot, helmet lights, right angle lights, box lights, all very important. And if you notice, lights are on everything. They're on your SCBAs, you have beacons, you have heads up displays, you have them on everything. Inside the fire truck, you've got warning lights, you've got red, red lights or night mode lights. You've got all kinds of flashing visual overload of lights. Just make sure you understand what those lights mean, when you should use them, when you should dim them, and when you should focus them in on certain areas. Okay, because we have a brow light on some of our engine companies. When we pull up on a motor vehicle accident and we're far back, you turn that brow light on, it illuminates the scene. It's amazing. You pull up 15 feet from a car wreck and the police officers are just getting out and you turn that brow light on, they're going to want to fight you because you just blinded everybody. Nobody can see anything and they're wandering out in traffic. They look like they've been hitting the head with a baseball bat. They're like, what happened? I can't see. It's uh, I believe Fox Fury makes a light that's similar to uh, what do you call those things, Chris? The flash bangs. They throw them in there and it has that startle effect. That's what we've done to them when we turn on a light like that. So make sure you understand what each of these lights are used for and use them in the proper context. Now, when you talk about buying a light, you got to have some non-negotiables when you talk about when you're getting a light. Is it fire resistance? Why? Where are we going again? The most unforgiving environment known to man. And I'm not talking about the fire station. I'm talking about inside the fire. The fire station is pretty rough, especially at shift change. But you're talking about the light itself is going into an environment where it could be dropped. It could be kicked. It could be burned. It could be submerged in a pool. It could be forgotten about. And then the next shift, you say, oh, man, I left that tripod light that fired. Captain's going to kill me. And you go out and get it in your own car. Okay. This example here is showing how durable this light is because they set it on fire and it still worked. Is it waterproof? You work in a very wet, nasty environment. Is it going to take an impact? Why? How many times have you been on an incident and you've seen something come out the second floor window, dropped off the truck, they left it on the tailboard, the bumper of the fire truck, my favorite, and they drive off and it drag it down the road or it bounces down the road at 60 miles an hour. All that stuff matters. And if you're an NFPA guy like me, it's got to meet NFPA 1971 8.6, at least the 2013 edition. And is that beam going to be bright enough? Is it going to shine far enough? And is it the proper angle for the environment and the context you're going to use in it? So there's no, hey, one light for everything. There's no pull the pre-connect inch and three quarter fire, uh, hose line for every fire. We use the right tool in the right context. So understand like this light here is like a box light. That's what I would use it for. I wouldn't use that for a standard right angle light purpose. Here's some of the definitions you heard so far and all this stuff. We, we've included some resources for you because I know a lot of firefighters now, this generation, the one thing I love about the, the new generation of firefighters is they don't just take your word for it. They're going to go look it up. Well, here's a couple examples. Here's Candela, how it's rated and, and Lumen. Uh, ingress protection, that's what the IP in the first two letters of that acronym stands for. Uh, you got LUX. We talked about that at the beginning, how it lights up a given area or a square meter. 
uh, my friends from overseas would like to hear meter, not foot, right? And then beam distance, basically at a distance of one meter, reading one lux indicates one candela, and we can translate that out. How Basically, how far a flashlight will throw a beam and how, how well is it going to illuminate that? And for those of you who really want to get into comparisons, I took the brand names off of here, so I'm not going to beat anybody up. But I took four different right angle lights that I found on the internet, and I just read their criteria, read their instructions. I took their lumen ratings, I took their beam distance, and most of them did not publish the beam angle. So when you were asking which light and why, look at the ratings here. They all start between 30 and 80 lumens and go up to as high as 400 but some of them don't go as far in beam distance. And then some don't list the beam angle, but some of them list a lot of features. It's got interchangeable focus points, peripheral focus, flashlight, floodlight, strobe light. Okay, how many of you, when you go into a fire, try to operate lots of buttons with your gloved hands on? How well does that work? Because what I've learned in teaching thermal imaging is the more buttons, the more mistakes we make because we have gloves that don't have a lot of dexterity. I mean, you can't do surgery with those gloves on, if you know what I mean. So if I have small buttons or lots of buttons, or if I hit a button and it changes it to something I don't want it to do, not a big fan of that. I'd rather have one or two application modes, that's it. I don't need nine different functions or modes in a fire, because it's not an Xbox game. I need to be able to turn it on, I need it to do what it's supposed to do in its desired context. That's just my advice. And for those of you, like I said, who want to go deeper, this is where we got all the information from. And I have some more, if you're interested, came from the Lighting Handbook, 9th edition, Patterns of Firefighter Fireground Injuries, Fireground Injuries Fact Sheets, Firefighter Fatalities, Risk Reduction on Emergency Response, and an awesome book from Dr. Grossman called On Combat, because we talk about physiology of the human eye. So that's where we got it from, because I'm not smart enough to risk your life or your money on my opinion. I want you to have facts. As they say, you can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. This is my contact information right here at the top. It's my uh, email address. And these are all the wonderful sponsors here, including Fox Fury, our website where we post blogs. We'll actually post some informative blogs about lighting between now and the uh, third webinar we're going to do. We're going to take some articles from our friends and add some interesting information to it, make it more what, what we like to call experientially relevant to our world. And that's my phone number. You can call me or text me, but don't call after 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, please. Uh, it makes boss mad. And I will let Chris explain uh, about their uh, uh, special deal they're offering right now. And I have the actual uh, Command Plus light and the BTS light. Love both of them. I just recommend the BTS light in either the yellow or the orange because everything's black and you drop black stuff in a fire, you can't find it. So I got mine in orange because I like to be able to find my stuff because the older I get, the more I lose stuff. Chris, would you like to chime in? Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, we have the Structure Fire Lighting Kit that we just launched last month. We're pretty excited about that because uh, these two items are probably the two most popular lights uh, that we sell with uh, Structure Firefighters. And it gives you a good combination of um, a headlamp that's going to pro provide a wide pan panoramic beam um, for close-up tasks, uh, like Andy mentioned, uh, pointing it up to read the direction of smoke and um, whatever else you'd be using that for. And then you have the BTS uh, right angle light, which is our latest adapt adaptation of a right angle light. Um, it has a low profile head that's going to be you know, easier on your turnout, so it's not obstructing your movement and getting in the way, but it still provides a really tight beam to you know, cut through that smoke and really be able to see uh, better. Um, you were talking a little bit about the uh, waterproof rating. That's something that we have always taken very seriously with all of our products. Um, and we rate uh, both of these and many of our products at an IPX7 which exceeds the IP6568 uh, ratings. Um, but that basically means that you can uh, put these lights underwater, submer submerge them for 30 minutes. Uh, what is it, one meter at mm -hmm. 30 minutes. Um, that's correct. And it will continue to function great. So um, that's uh, one of our priorities as a company is just 
you know, building tools that are going to be higher quality and more reliable so that when you're, you know, in the heat of battle, you're, you know, your stuff's going to work. And it, we may not have a lot of extra features, but like you talked about, Andy, when, you know, when it matters, you're not going to be wanting to, you know, fiddle with stuff and switch stuff out. You're really, there's probably, you know, one or two things that you're going to want to adjust. And that's probably the, the brightness and maybe the angle of the light. So yep. uh, we, we try to do that. I agree with that completely. And if you read uh, Dr. Grossman's work, you'll learn that no matter how well trained we are, unless you're a stress inoculation expert, the more we get stressed out and the higher our heart rate goes, the less things we can do and do well. We can do a few tasks and we can do them really well. The, the tasks that need to preserve life. So you don't want a lot of intricate uh, details and skills you have to perform with the gear that we wear. You want to be able to do the things you train to do. So make sure that whatever you buy, it's something that's going to work well for you and the way you work. Is it going to, is it going to fit you ergonomics wise? Is it too heavy? Then don't carry it. You know, you want something that's light, bright. It's going to take, take the beating and it's going to be durable because, I mean, it's your hard-earned money, too, if, if you're able to buy one and, and carry one. Then you don't want to go out and spend a bunch of money, and next thing you know, it, it, in 12 months, it's already broken, and you got to do it again. I mean, I, don't, I still don't understand to this day why everybody has to get a brand-new $1,400 cell phone every year. But yet, we can't buy a flashlight, or we can't buy a thermal imaging camera. But, well, I'm going to go get me an iPhone 12, and it's almost $2,000. I'm like, say what? My, my MacBook didn't cost that much. Uh, you know, it's, it's what we value. So think about the context of the environment, like Chris said, and is it going to help you? Is it going to help your guys and gals in the fire department? It's going to help you fulfill the mission to make an investment in you and, and get the right tools and make sure your department's good with you carrying them and using them so you don't get in trouble. And they said, well, hey, Andy Starnes guy said I could do it. No, I didn't. Ask permission first, not forgiveness later, Okay. You want to hit stop share, Chris, or do you want to leave this up? Um, actually, one one quick other thing. You touched on it real briefly, but yes, sir. Um, you know, talking about the concept of redundancy and how important mm -hmm. that is uh, with your tools. Um, if one fails, then you know, <laughs> literally, you're in the dark. That's um, right. Having redundancy can be quite beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I agree because. Uh, the, the problem we have is we don't have a lot of redundancy built into our systems. Like certain air packs don't have a backup system. If the airline fails, certain air packs do, uh, you know, if, if your nozzle fails, you want it to fail in the open position, not the closed position. If your computer controlled pump uh, panel I had this discussion earlier with someone, if it fails, there should be a way for you to manually open and close the valves. So there should be some redundancy built into your system. We teach a lot of primary methods in the fire service, whether it's search, fire attack, staying oriented. You better have some secondary, some plan Bs and Cs. Because when you read these line of duty death reports and these near miss reports, all of them happened when they weren't all in plan A. The things they normally did did not work, right? The flashlight may have failed. The camera may have failed. Whatever it is, they normally do fail, and they didn't have something else to fall back on. So having some redundancy, having an extra light, it's not going to hurt you, okay? You know, just make sure you understand the why behind it. It's not because we want you to look like a Christmas tree. We want you to be the light in the darkness for the person you're trying to find and have the right context, the right tools for that moment when you need it and when they need you. Not because I want to look really cool on Facebook. Okay, we're there to make a difference. And that difference takes work, education, and understanding along with that training. Don't just train and do skills, do training, do the skills, and deepen your understanding of it. I can challenge you on anything. Don't just do sets and reps without understanding why you're doing sets and reps, because you can do them wrong and get really good at doing it wrong. Trust me, I've been really good at doing a lot of things wrong for 20 plus years. And it's hard to fix that at my age. So fix it early. It's my challenge to you. So thank you, Chris and Nikki, for the opportunity. Yeah. And I uh, just want to remind our viewers that uh, we will be doing a couple more webinars here in the next couple months, um, looking at uh, lighting and context, a little bit more detail of technique of how you would use each ones in uh, actual scenarios. 
and then also talking about um, different roles. So how the guy in the truck is going to use lighting compared to the uh, battalion chief, uh, compared to you know someone who's uh, entering the building. So uh, look for those. We'll be sending out a uh, this webinar, a recording of this webinar, out in an email here in probably the next couple of days, and um, then look for invites to the next webinars and you can learn a little bit more from uh, Chief Starnes. Any questions that we missed, Chris or Nikki? Uh, I don't think so. I think we kind of covered everything looking through the chat. So I think that was pretty good. So um, we'd like to thank you for spending your time and um, providing some awesome uh, information on lighting and uh, look forward to the next round. I really do look forward and I thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate y'all's support. And uh, the last thing I challenge you firefighters and those who are watching it today, you know, we need light for everything we do. Just make sure that when you are shining the light out there, make sure your your behavior is the right light for people to look to, okay? Because firefighters today in the world we live in, we need to be a good example. Don't just have the right tools on you, be the right person with the right tools and emulate that for other firefighters to see. Hang around good people like uh, Nikki and Chris and a bunch of people that I hang around with and pray that their good behavior rubs off on you because that's what I do. Hope y'all have a great day. Thanks so much for listening to me babble and rant. It's always fun. I always enjoy uh, learning, and I hope that you continue learning. And as my friend John said earlier, don't just be aggressive. Stay intelligently aggressive. Understand why we need to get in there and how we can do it better. Thanks a lot.